but I thought particularly in these times when men are getting a fairly bad rap, mostly deserved, um, I, I, it would be interesting to write a poem about a, a, a journey around the body of a man. Um, I'm not gay, but I hope the gay people would like this one. Body of a man. What is this thing, this noble masterwork? Consider him, his temple, cranium, the arch of brow, the tendons of the neck, the long jaw gently furred with its dark bloom, the curved lips made to sing or to command, the elbow nerveless now, the blue pulse wrist, the helplessness of that compelling hand that is a hammer when it makes a fist, the leverage of shoulder with its blade, behold the muscle drawn ap across its pit, the downy recess that the muscle made, behold what power must belong to it, the barrel of the chest with each chaste nipple laid on the thews that carelessly disown them, now swells and falls beneath the ribs' smooth ripple, such miracles if one were ever shown them, the pebbles of the hidden vertebrae, the rock-hard hocks, the buttock's double disc, the salmon flank along the femur's way, but then the central flower and the risk, see Jove's grand acorns, his rose marble tower, recumbent now upon the sleeping thigh, the source and limitation of his power, the reason he must fight and he must die, his ankles crossed, as if upon a nail he lies there unaware of any gaze, for who today would celebrate the male or dare to give him any word of praise? Another somewhat in the same in the same vein. Farewell to arms. The cock will stand and crow, the bull will bellow. What is a man if he cannot desire? Poor fool that for a pair of breasts must follow, that for a secret nest must catch on fire. Take these away, and what a god he is! Simple and noble often, questing, curious, the knight who seeks out nature's mysteries and on his homecoming is generous. But who? Would, but would he be these things without the spur of that imagined maiden in his dream, his hairy, muscled body built for her, his ship that breasts the billows of the stream? Boys, boys, your time is over now. The brute must be disarmed, his song be mute. And an even darker poem, since we're in dark times, and this poem... This poem is about, uh, it's imagining a future in which the demographic collapse, which is happening all over the world, has actually become terminal. That is, at some point, there are the, uh, uh, not enough children are being born, therefore not enough build the children in the next generation are being born, and so on and so on. Um, uh, people are just not having babies. Um, and this one, this one is entitled Post-Human. The cities still are perfect. Avenues of landmark architecture in diurnal turnings create a show of the eternal. Holograms flicker, reds and greens and blues. Lovingly mothballed galleries and museums have no eye to perceive their gathered stuff. The libraries are surely quiet enough. The universities are mausoleums. The solar cells still work, but year by year the robot cleaners fail and their repairers forget their programs, cannot fix the errors. Sometimes the parks are filled with timid deer. The planet cools, the forests are returning. They drop their leaves to make tomorrow's soil. Into the rustling springtime of their toil they draw the smoke of humankind's long burning. Nowhere is heard that curious oboe hooting that once was human speech so close and dear when there were human selves and ears to hear. Of course, there's also no more sound of shooting. 
dog packs, inexplicably bored and sad, slowly forget the gods they loved and nuzzled, they seem to search for something missing, puzzled, and quietly revert to going mad. The last astronomers had found the answer to Fermi's troubled question, where they are, where are those friends upon another star, where is the partner to the human dancer? The demographic singularity, unrecognised but by its explanation, had come about without recrimination, and that last menopause came silently. The last thawed egg, quickened with urgent care, guarded and served by ancient crazed retainers, has aged alone with robot entertainers and passed in splendid raptures of despair. The old war of the sexes now finds peace. The perfect treaty, separate and equal. No more oppression, no backsliding sequel, no need for the political police. No sexism, no dog whistles, no slurs, no in-law jokes, no sly microaggressions, no diaper changes, toxic dispossessions, family outings, no more his and hers. No crowded beaches, no self-sacrifice, no war, no art, no science, no poetizing, no memory, no cheery fraternizing, no tactful and considerate replies, no lust, no boredom with the other sex, no strife for power and individuation, no voice, no bold self-actualization, no clever denigration of your ex, no sweet good morrow with the rising sun, no pretty spread of legs upon the cover, no gazing in the strange eyes of your lover, no wonder at the new world that's begun. Another one in the same vein. Mad King Lear. Lear spelt in the old way, L-I-R. The Mad Bird King, yeah. I am Mad Lear, or so they called me, when there were folk who knew my name, when there were folk once known as humans, when madness was once counted shame. From ruin city after city I go, but there's no reason why. The birds sing and the hawthorns pretty, and I've forgotten how to die. I'm going green, my hair is shaggy, like moss upon a fallen tree. I live on sun and air and water, there's no deliverance for me. The tribes have all avenged each other with rockets, guns and spears and sticks. The band I led, the last true humans, all died in 2066. In all the stars there is no other being that can look up and know. When we knew this we fell to murder, for no one there could tell us no. I live beneath the quiet snowfall, the blowing petals of the spring. All hate and love is gone forever. Sometimes I raise my head and sing. Vanitas. This is another dark poem. It's a personal one. Vanitas. When you have come to where whatever ending must be an anticlimax and a joke, when everything you've done is not worth the defending, the brightest harness just another yoke, when loves are fruitless and old friendships past the mending, then why not go for broke? When those you love can rightly not respect you, when those who love you you would fain avoid, when those whose judgment you would value still reject you, and they are dead whose spirit you enjoyed, when every night your own dark afterthoughts dissect you, guilty or paranoid, then that's the time to sit in some quiet garden and watch the bright-eyed swallows zipping by, the ultraviolet sages offering their own free pardon, the yucca flowers sucked by a butterfly. Resign, undo the harness, shuffle off the burden, and learn how best to die. There's a kind of hope at the end of that one, which I want to pursue a little, a couple more poems. 
Indian Summer A visit from a blue and golden ghost, the ghost of Texas August in November. Nothing but cold rain ever since September. Now it's the season that I love the most. The oaks are turning now, the butterflies batting their brown wings on the violet asters. I've turned the TV off on the disasters. The only news is ears and nose and eyes. The creek is roaring still. I hear a plane inch through the blue so high you cannot see it. This is a day you cannot know but be it. That bee, dark honey gold, drones round again. This is an old man's poem with plodding rhymes. An Indian summer poem in troubled times. And the thing that makes things worth it is love, I suppose. Love and beauty. And love is, how can I put it, it's the, uh, the prime derivative of beauty. Where we are. And this is for my wife, Maylin. Where is home if it is not with you in whatever dark land where we wander? Where the alien hills we travel through faintly echo with a distant thunder? Where the ghosts of some old friend we knew shows up on a half-deserted street, waves, but has another thing to do in this pleasant country of defeat. Where we are, though, always was the centre, where your index points from, as does mine, and whatever strangerhood we enter, now deictic changes to a sign we were never strangers, always here, even in this December of the year. I got very interested in the word dictic, deictic, or... Um, uh, in Charles Sanders' purse, I think he tells, calls it indexical. That is, those words which only mean something when you know where they're coming from. Like here, uh, if I'm somewhere else, then I'm still here, but I'm not here. Um, and uh, that, um, that quality of uh, index, of, of De deicity or something like that the being hereness um, and of course Heidegger talks about this um, uh, it, it's almost as if everything is a sort of person everything is here for it um, and that uh, this has the most interesting metaphysical and also physical uh, implications because the whole notion of the eigenfunction is the that is the hereness of a particular particle and uh, this is also implicit in the fermi um, uh, in the whole theory of 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 the particle that cannot you can't have two particles in the same place same time with the same charge and so on The Discoverers, for Melin on our 53rd wedding, wedding anniversary. The Discoverers. We, to, we too are old explorers, venturing into these altitudes of time and loss, easy in camp to kindle fire or bring cold water from the snow streams in the moss. This journey of discovery has been so long and hard we almost can't remember what finding out our destiny might mean. Can April's dream still wake us in December? But still, sometimes, we find a warmer dell, a dry cave looking south into the sun, blackberries flourishing along the fell, birds' eggs for breakfast, washing to be done. Soon we'll strike out once more, though, for the heights lit nightly by those eerie northern lights. And just a few more. 
shooting at 76. I'm 76 years old, but I, I've been, for the last few years, I've been so developing a, a, a second martial art, which is archery. So I, I, I do archery uh, out near my, my cabin in the country. Shooting at 76. I seek an arrow in this amber light, this liquid stillness clear as honey. I knew as soon as it had taken flight that I had overshot. It was uncanny how much more swiftly it had flown than all the others and just disappeared like a few seconds back the sun. These endings aren't as I feared. Selling the place, starting to say goodbyes, finding young folk to take the old tasks over, laughing that they could think me wise, sad that they should need to seek my favour. The west glows yet, night rises in the east. My arrow's lost then, but it flew at least. An evening walk. Why should this moment, coming down the hill, the last sun under cloud, suddenly glowing upon my little house, not quite fulfil all heavenly promises, all bestowing? Is it that the pure mind is lacking still, that the heart aches at all that is still owing? Il faut laisser, one must leave, and it's a quote from Ronsard, il faut laisser maison, jardin, uh, what is it, maison, verger, jardin, you must leave your house, your orchard and your, your gardens. Il faut laisser. All life is farewells, vanishings. What was the mansion of your soul becomes a shack, a cave, a hole. Learn to dis dispense with earthly things. They'll cut the trees you planted there, truck out the rubbish of your days. They'll burn the poems, phrase by phrase, and all your words are only air. But still the fall is lovely here. The aging house still keeps you warm. The morning after this great storm is brighter, fresher and more clear. The more they tell you their farewell, the more they drift into the past until there comes a time at last when there is nothing left to sell and freedom with its edge of fear opens before the trembling soul, the parts all sublimated to the whole, all that was there transformed to hear.